come to the book of Deuteronomy, and as I told you before, uh, most of you weren't thinking, please let it be Deuteronomy today. We kind of think of Deuteronomy as what I call flyover country in the Bible, right? You know, we kind of just ask yeah, a bunch of legalese, who's got time for that? Let's just skip Deuteronomy. But Deuteronomy is actually a collection of sermons from Moses to the people of Israel, and they're basically the last sermons, the last things that he ever said to Israel. So if you're down to your last few sermons and you know it, don't you think that what you say is going to matter? When you want to make sure that those last words would be important? And so when you come to Deuteronomy, what you find is this, this kind of just re-emphasizing this whole idea of being in a covenant relationship with God and all that that is, all that that involves. And I would submit that you and I need to pay attention to this today. Because the whole idea of what it means to be in a covenant, some of you right now are going, I'm not even sure what that word even means. I get it. The whole idea of being in a covenant completely lost on us today. And, and yet, I would submit that being in a covenant relationship with God, the biggest game changer that we could ever hope for in our life. Exactly what is a covenant? When we talk about covenant, what are we talking about? A covenant is an oath that seals a relationship. Okay, just think of it that way. It's built on a promise of blessing if you keep the covenant. Here's the benefits. And if you break the covenant, it's a promise of cursing that you're going to encounter if you break the agreement. So you think about this. This is serious business, okay? A covenant says, hey, I am in this relationship for the long haul no matter what. Whether it seems to benefit me or whether it seems to not benefit me, I am in this relationship no matter what. I believe that this relationship, this covenant brings about blessings, and I'm all about those blessings. I want to experience those blessings, so I'm in. And if I try to get out of this covenant, I understand that there are cursings I will have to face, and I'm in this thing couple of things about covenant become clear to you as you kind of study what you just read. The first thing that you know is that a covenant is about love. There's this, this intimacy. There's this, uh, if you will, in a, in a good, healthy way, there's this ownership, right? Now, you look here in this covenant, what do you see? You see that kind of language. He will be our God. We will be His people. Where's this coming from? It's coming from the idea of covenant. And when you're in covenant, man, you're in a love relationship. Covenant, it's all about love. Okay, that's the first thing you notice. The second thing that you notice about covenant is that it's not just about love. It's also about law. Now, we see these things as completely opposite, don't we? What's going on here? We see these two as completely opposite, but not in a covenant. A covenant's about love, but a covenant is also about law. This whole relationship, think about it, you are locked in. This is a serious binding contract between two people. And this is hard for us to understand because we think that happiness comes when there are no restrictions, right? If I'm going to be happy, i got to keep my options open, right? So we, we look at it that way. No, covenant says the opposite. It's true. You want real freedom? lock yourself in. You want real happiness, real joy? Lock yourself in. A covenant is about a binding relationship. And if you think about where we are today as a culture, some of the greatest challenges that we face is that relationships that ought to be binding, that ought to lock us in, are not binding at all. They're not covenant relationships. They're really more of consumer relationships, aren't they? Now think about it for a moment in life. What are we seeing? We're seeing an explosion of consumer relationships that used to be covenant relationships, right? Some people now view marriage as a consumer relationship. As long as I'm getting my needs met, I'm here. The day that I stop getting my needs met, I'm out of here. Some people view church that way. It's a consumer relationship for me. People will do the same thing in their relationship with God, right? Right? How many of y'all have ever heard someone say, I'm spiritual, I'm just not religious? What are they saying? I want to be able to keep my options open. That's what they're saying. I'm not going to commit to anything. I'm not going to give up any freedom here. I'm not going to give up any liberty. I'm not going to be all in. You know, I'm, I'm kind of dating God. I'm not married to Him. Right? 
That's what they're really saying. Now here, here's the problem, and this passage that we're looking at today, this really helps us understand this. God is not interested in a consumer relationship with you. That's not what he is after. Now, God says, come, taste and see that it is good, right? God invites us into a relationship with him. But what manner of relationship is that invitation? It is an invitation to consider taking on a covenant relationship. And a covenant relationship has teeth. It has strings attached. It is blessings and cursings. Because we, we, we look at verse 20 and it says that God won't forgive a broken covenant. And it sounds all wrong to us. How can God be so amped up and be such a stickler for the law? I thought God was all love, right? So how can this possibly coexist? Because we do. We see it in Scripture. God is love. God does say that he will forgive you. God does say that he will bless. But on the other hand, the Bible makes it clear that God completely rejects disobedience and that he judges it and he punishes it, punishes it. And he rejects our desire to go our own way. I mean, the Bible makes it clear. God punishes our sin full stop. No questions asked. So which is it? Is God unconditional love? Or does God also punish sin? So Moses, as he's having some of these last sermons with the people of Israel, he wants them to understand this. Okay? So he starts pointing them to where they can learn how this thing really works, this whole idea of covenant works. Back in this day, to enter into a covenant with someone, you took animal, an animal and you divided it in half. You cut him in half and you put part of the animal here and part of the animal here. And then the party of the covenant would then walk through in between the two pieces. And you're thinking, man, that is gnarly and graphic. Yes, it is both gnarly and it is graphic. So why this gnarly graphic thing? Here's what you were saying. You were saying, I'm entering into this covenant today, this binding agreement. And if I don't hold up my end of the bargain, if I break this covenant, may I be like this animal. May I be torn into pieces and birds come and pick at my flesh. I am not breaking this agreement. Now, if you were making a covenant with a king, you would walk between the pieces, right? But would you expect the king to walk between the pieces? No. He's the king. But what happens in our story? God, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of all of that, God descends and he appears and he passes between the pieces. What's going on here? God says, if I don't keep up my end of the covenant, may my glory be put out and may I be torn into pieces. Is God serious about keeping his end of the covenant? Yeah, you'd better believe it. So when does Abraham pass through the pieces? He doesn't. Abraham never passes through the pieces. Only God passes through the pieces. Well, what does this mean? God is effectively saying this. If I don't keep up my end of the covenant, I'm going to be torn into pieces. May I be torn into pieces just like this? And then he's saying, and if you don't keep your end of the covenant, I'll be torn to pieces. I'll pay the price. I'll pay the penalty think about that for a moment because hundreds of years later the sky turns black and Jesus Christ is crucified on a cross and he is beaten and he is tortured and he is torn to pieces but I want you to understand something when Jesus invites you into a covenant, he's already walked through the pieces. He's already paid the penalty. He's already made the sacrifice. He's already borne the curse for you. 
And he's done so because God loved us so very much that though we would break the covenant with him, he has chosen to bear the punishment for our breach of the covenant himself himself. 